Put your trust in Him. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 4. We've been seeing here, you know, and, and we talked about here a few, a couple of weeks ago how that, you know, chapters 3 and 1 through 3, Paul is giving doctrinal instruction to the church, to the people. And that doctrinal instruction still is, is uh, in force, however you want to go. It's still good for us today. Let me put it that way. We need this instruction that the Lord has given. There's a, a portion of the church today that would say, Oh, we don't need doctrine anymore. Yeah, we do. Doctrine is teaching. We need to be taught. We need to know what it is that Christ has done for us at Calvary. We need to know, as we saw this morning there in Luke, we need to know that what's impossible with man is possible with God. We need that understanding and we need to believe that. We need that faith to believe that. That God is able to do that which we cannot do in our hearts and our lives, our living for Him. And that's what Paul is talking about here in Ephesians chapter 4. You see, a lot of people, a lot of believers, they get saved, they'll come to Christ. But then they'll say, I just can't do it. I can't live the way God wants me to live. And really, that is an understanding that God wants us to come to. It's the understanding that the law, as we've been going through Romans and seeing that, it's the understanding for the, that, that's the purpose God gave the law, was to show us that we can't do it on our own, that we can't make it. And every believer, when we come to Christ, God has to bring us to that place. You know, whenever we got saved, we got saved because we came to a place to where we said, God, I can't, and we called out to Him, did we not? We said, Lord, I need Your forgiveness. I need You to forgive me of my sin because I can't do what I need, what needs to be done to be righteous in Your sight. And I put my faith and my trust in Christ and who He is and what He done for me at Calvary. And that's the initial salvation experience. But then as we go on, oftentimes we don't understand what he says in Colossians 2 and verse 6, that as you have therefore received Him, so walk ye in Him. See, there is a walk that we as believers, that walk, how we order our life, how we carry about our daily activity, whenever we see that word walk in the Word of God, that's what he's talking about. How you live out your life as a believer. How you walk as a believer. And we got to come to that place just as we did whenever we first were saved. We couldn't save ourselves. And as a believer, we see in the Word of God the instruction. You know, God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And for most of us, probably all of us, when we first get saved, we read that, we hear that preached, and we say, okay, I can do it now. I can do it. And we strike out on our own. Trying to live for the Lord by the means of our own strength, our own ability. Paul in Romans chapter 7 would describe that for us. He would show us the futility of trying to live for the Lord in our own strength and ability trying to live for the Lord, saying, I can do this or I can do that for God. And, and you know, a lot of times in the church today we hear that word where somebody is burnt out or somebody is just used up. And, and, and the only reason that a believer would be burned out, so to speak, is if they're trying to live for the Lord by their own strength and ability, doing things, doing the work of God, the good stuff, the good things, doing that work for the Lord in our own strength, we will burn out because we can't do it. Amen. We can't make it on our own. We've got to have the help. And see, God knows that. But He's got to bring us to a knowing of that. We've said it often. Don't you know? That's what Paul is trying to bring to our understanding here in, in the book of Ephesians and in the other epistles that have been written. Trying to get us to know that which we don't know. Because as I've said in the past, if you don't know it, you can't walk in it. If you don't know it, you can't place your faith there. 
You see, not we don't place our faith in ourselves. We've got to know that our faith must rest in who He is and what He has done for us, and it must rest there alone. And it is a rest. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. He says that we, have, uh, we already have victory in our lives. The majority of believers, we, they don't know what it is to walk and to have that rest and to have that victory that Christ has provided for us at Calvary because they don't know that their faith must rest solely in who He is. A lot of times we don't know our faith isn't resting solely in Him. Hmm. But we, when we begin to understand the message of the cross, and I say begin to understand it because we'll never fully know it all. But you can know more today than you knew yesterday. You can know more next week than you knew this week. By pressing Him, by asking Him, by seeking Him, by drawing near to Him. Not in your own strength once again. But because He is there for you. And, and here in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, as I said, Paul has given doctrine, he's given teaching that we might know. You know, he, he's just told us that we're all part of the same body. There in chapter 3, he's saying that we all have a function to perform. He's showing us that we all have a place in this body. We all have a, a job in this body. And, and you know, I said there we have a function to perform. We have a work to do, but we need to understand Yes, you do have something, you have a task that God has established for you, but you know what? It's a task that God hasn't said, you have to make it on your own. It's a task that God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect through your weakness. Whenever we realize that God, I can't do it, then His Holy Spirit will come in. His Holy Spirit will move in our hearts and our lives he will show us what to do and He will empower you for that work that He has for you to do all for the purpose of giving glory to Jesus Christ. Everything that we do in the body of Christ, everything that we do out in our daily walk in life is to bring glory to Jesus. It's to bring Him all the praise because He deserves the praise. If we're spirit led, as he would say down in, as he will say in Ephesians 5 and 18, if the spirit has control, then we will be glorifying Christ. Walk in the spirit, he would say in Romans, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Carry about your life being led by the, yes, it is possible. When we realize and we understand I can't, but I know you can. As we saw there in Luke this morning, with man, what's impossible with man is possible with God. Man can't do it on his own. You can't do it on your own. we got to have his help. And so in chapter 4, we're going to pick up there in verse 17. I'm thinking I said that... Uh, Parts of the body was in three, but it's in four. They're the first parts of four. So go back and read that. Go back and listen to last week's message. But Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17, Paul picks up here and he says, This I say therefore. He says, This is what I'm saying. Because of what has preceded. Because that we are all part of the body of Christ. He says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not, underline that, walk not as other Gentiles, as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Paul is saying, because of what I've taught you, because of where you are in the body of Christ, he says, don't be walking like you used to walk. Don't be living like you used to live, he said. He said, don't be living like the world around you lives today 
in the church. We need an understanding that we are to come out from among them and be ye separate. And we need to understand that that coming out, that separating, that not looking like the world is not something that we're going to be able to do in and of our own strength and ability. Do you know that it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to come out from among them? There's a term that's used in the world today called peer pressure. And we understand, most of us know what peer pressure is. If you've never heard that term, it, 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 it is peer. It is those that are around you, your friends and your neighbors and your acquaintances. They will be living, as Paul is saying here in verse 17, if they don't know the Lord and sometimes, unfortunately, because they don't understand. There that we saw in Luke 18 that God, what's impossible with man is possible with God. They don't understand that it, that it's not or that it, it, it is possible to not live bound by sin. Do you know that today? It is possible for you, possible for me, that we not be bound by the power of the sin nature, that we not be bound by self. You don't have to live a selfish life. Hmm. You don't have to live that way any longer. By the power of the Holy Spirit, of the Spirit of God, that Spirit, Romans tells us that that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. He shall, you notice, if that Spirit that raised Christ from the dead the dead. Do you realize what it took to raise Christ from the dead? Do you realize the power that's resident in the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of God? He says, if that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. He's saying it is possible. It is a fact that if you've given your life to Christ, that that same Holy Spirit that had the power to raise up Jesus Christ from the dead, that that same Holy Spirit dwells in you and He can empower, He can quicken, He can make alive your mortal body. He can empower and strengthen you to live that life that Paul's going to talk about here. We got to have that power in our life. We can't do it on our own. Even being saved, born again, you can't do it by yourself. God knew that. That's why He gave the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. That's why He gave His Spirit to you and I, to those who will believe how much we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. I want to say just here briefly in passing, being born of the Spirit, saved, is not the same as being baptized in the Holy Spirit. What did he say whenever you be baptized in the Holy Spirit? You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. To be, there's a big difference in being and doing. To be a witness. That means to be able to live out this life in your life. Be a witness. That don't mean you had to go knocking on doors. Knocking on doors is fine. That doesn't mean that you have to go and, and, and tell everybody about Jesus. Because your life, when you are being a witness, your life will be a witness without you ever saying a word. They're going to know when they're around you. There's not that filthy communication coming out of your mouth that you're not living in the same manner and way that they are living. And they're going to look and they're going to say, how does he do it? He's got something that I want because I don't. There is nobody in their right mind. Hear me. Nobody in their right mind wants to live bound by sin. I don't care who they are. But because they don't know what it is they have available to them in Christ, they are bound by that sin nature. But there's not a person alive in this world that wants that. And we need to be the ones living it out. Living out that freedom, that liberty, 
You see, the church has had it all backwards when they said, oh, grace covers our sins. Yes, it does. Or grace gives me license to sin. If you're thinking grace gives you license to sin, you don't understand grace. You don't know that God's grace is the enabling power of the Holy Spirit working in you, giving you freedom and liberty from the power and the dominion of the sin nature and sin in general, however you want to call it. But it's His Holy Spirit. And so He says here in verse 17, I say therefore, because you have the Spirit of God living in you, you've been filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit. I say this, therefore for this reason, and I testify in the Lord. What Paul is saying there when he says, I testify in the Lord, he's saying this word is coming straight from the Lord Himself coming to you through me and God is saying I or Paul is saying I testify in the Lord that you henceforth what does henceforth means it means from this time forward from now on from this day forward hear me today folks from this day forward I've given you an understanding of this scripture he says that you I testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not. Don't walk in this manner. Hmm. But he's also saying, letting us know, how do we walk not? Not in our own strength and ability, but by the power of the Holy Spirit is how we walk. You see, they walk. Those Gentiles, the, 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 those who don't know the Lord, let's just put it that way, the unsaved, they don't walk in the power of the Spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. They walk under the power and the dominion of that sin nature, bound by sin at its behest to do what it wills for them to do. He says that you walk not. You know what he's saying as well and what he's not saying there? He's saying it is possible for a believer if he does not understand what's available for him through Calvary and the power of the Holy Spirit. If we don't know, how many times did he said, don't be ignorant. I would not have you ignorant brethren. If we don't know what we have and we don't know where our faith is to rest, we will be walking. That's a default position for man because of the fall. Even a saved man, woman, boy, girl, boys and girls, no other type, just a, you know where I'm going there. But there's nothing, there's, if we're not knowing what it is that Christ has done for us at Calvary, we will be walking as other Gentiles, as he would say, as other those who are not saved. We will be carrying out our life because we don't have any other, play, any other uh, way of going. Even as a believer, when our faith is misplaced, we don't know what it is that's available for us through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we're living under law, we're living by means of our own strength, our own ability. We're living in a way that God hasn't designed for His people to live. You see, God has a design and a plan for you, and that, is a, that, that plan and design is for you to simply trust Him. That song we sang, simply trust Him. Put your trust, put your hope, put your faith in Him. It's just that simple. And he said he would, in Romans 8 and 1 and 2, he's promised us the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. He said it's the law of the Spirit. It's how the Holy Spirit works. It's the way that God has designed it for us to have the help of the Spirit in our lives. It's, a, it's a, a law as sure as the law of gravity and probably even more surer than that. The law of gravity can be overcome by the law of aerodynamics, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus cannot be overcome by any other law. We live as a believer. We live really as anybody. We live under two laws. We live under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus or we live under the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death says you sin, you die. 
The law of the Spirit says you put your trust in Christ and you live. The law of the Spirit of life. The life is what it actually says in the Greek. That life that comes to us by what Jesus did for us at Calvary. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, the word coming straight from the Lord, that you from now on, evidently there were some that were walking in the flesh. That's what Paul's talking about here in this this, this section of Ephesians. You go over to Romans chapter 8. And and, and you can read, walking in the flesh, walking in the Spirit. Paul contrasts the two. And here he says that you walk no longer longer as the Gentiles walk. And he says they're walking in the vanity. And I put a red note on that one, so we have to read the note. He said you walk in the vanity. Vanity is that which is vain, aimless, resultless, and futile. They walk in the futility of of their mind. Notice there he said, "My go back to Romans chapter 8. He talks about the mind there as well. Putting your mind on Christ. Having your mind set on the things of the Lord. Go listen to the teaching. There are a few Thursday nights about that. We were covering it. It's no accident the Lord has us covering what He does. Because He's trying to instruct you and I. And He's trying to teach us to trust Him. To hold fast. Huh. Didn't we sing that? Oh, that was played. Hold to God's unchanging hand. That was our special for this morning. We've got to learn that we can't walk without holding His hand. We can't walk this walk lest we hold to the hand of our Lord. we got to have Him. What is it? Whenever you need somebody to hold your hand, you need them to stabilize you. When you're helping a little baby learn how to walk, we're all little babies if you don't, if you, if, you, if you realize it. We are dependent upon our Heavenly Father just as much as the baby is dependent on the mama or the daddy to be able to take care of that baby. We've got to come to that place of dependence on the Lord where we say, Lord, I can't even walk. I need you to stabilize me. Lord, I need you not just one hand but both hands. You ever took a baby and you're holding him up with his hands and teaching him to walk? That's how we need to be with the Lord saying, I can't even walk, Lord, hold both my hands. What happens if he's holding our hands? We're not using them to do, try to do it on our own. Hmm. We're recognizing, God, I need you. Oh, I need you every hour. Lord, I need you. Hmm. He's the one who will sustain us. He is the one who will establish us and stabilize us. He is our rock and our sure foundation. He is our refuge. He is our strong tower. He is our everything. Without Him, we can't do nothing. Mm. But He says, Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. The expositors, it's not the expositor study Bible, it's, but it, it, it's expositors with, uh, which we quote. He says it, it is a description of the walk of the heathen world. Generally a walk moving within the limits of intellectual and moral resultlessness. Given over to things devoid of worth or reality. Hmm given over to things that are devoid of worth or reality. They can't even think really with reality. They don't know the truth. What do we got going on in the world today? They think we're crazy because we trust in the Lord. But who's the crazier? The one who says you can chick that you can pick your gender after you've been born? The one who says, oh, I don't feel like a guy today. I feel like being a girl. I identify. Who's crazier? Really, think about it. Who's... That's just nuts. 
to say, oh, well, I'm not going to let, I'm not going to say what they were when they were born. I'm going to let them choose when they're five or ten or whatever. Foolishness, vanity. What did Solomon say? Vanity of vanities. Emptiness, void, useless, without reason. My goodness. You see, when sin has control, as we're going to see here in a few minutes if we get there, when sin is ruling and reigning in our lives, there is a darkness and a blindness. We can't even see what's real. That's what we're dealing with in this world today, folks. There is a darkness because there is an increase of sin because the church hasn't been taught. We've been told since the 80s now, oh, we don't need to hear doctrine. What a fool would say that. But yet they've written some of the number one best-selling books. They've had seminars on how to grow your churches. And they're the very ones espousing we don't need doctrine. Is it any wonder the church today is walking in darkness? Is it any wonder that that darkness is overshadowing the world? I think I talked a little bit Thursday about the creation and everything. What does it say in Genesis 1? That it was void and dark. God had to speak that light. God didn't create the world void and dark. God cannot create anything void and dark because He's perfect and everything He does is perfect. So when He created everything, it was perfect, right? Settle that. I've said that to many people. I don't know how many have really understood it. We need to settle it in our hearts, in our minds, that God is perfect. Everything He does is perfect. He doesn't do anything halfway, three-quarter, 99.9999999999999% of the way. Everything God does, ever has done, ever will do is perfect. That salvation. You see, if we don't settle that first and know that everything that God does is perfect and right and, and there's no flaw in it. He don't create things with, that are void and that are dark. There's not any kind of vacuum there. But God creates it all perfect. We settle that in our hearts. Then we don't have a problem with the salvation plan. With the salvation that God has provided for us in Christ. Because we know that He is perfect. That His salvation plan. What He did in Christ before the foundation of the world. That it is a perfect salvation. And we don't have to ask to it. We don't have to bring in our own thoughts. We don't have to say God I'll help you out here a little bit or we don't have to say that I have to do my part and God does his part. Your part is to believe that everything God has done is right and perfect and true and it don't need no help from your feeble little mind. We settle those things and we settle a lot of issues in our life. Amen? Amen? God is perfect and everything He does is perfect. And the salvation that He's provided for us in Christ is a perfect salvation. We can't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm. Hear that a lot. A lot of it's true. You can't fix it. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not. This is a command for us. Walk not as the other is what it says in the Greek. Gentiles walk. So Paul's speaking to Gentile believers. God doesn't just have salvation for the Jew. He doesn't just have a white, black, green, blue, whatever. He doesn't have just a special race and a, a, a special cultural salvation for this person or that person. He has salvation for all. No matter who you are. Do you know there's the Jew and everybody else was Gentile? There wasn't the Ethiopian Gentile. The, that, that may have been where they were from, but they were still Gentiles. God always had it in His plan, His perfect plan, that all men be saved. That all men should come to the knowledge of the truth. Walk not as other Gentiles walk. In the vanity, the emptiness, the uselessness, the futility. Hmm. You see how God sees the unsaved mind, useless, futile. 
There's a scripture that says that God laughs at man when man thinks he's so smart. God just sits in heaven and says, you've got to be kidding me. You think you know better than I do? <laughs> Let me show you. <laughs> oh, my, 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 my. Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. And here's what happens if we walk in that way. He says, having the understanding darkened. Having their understanding, their, their, what they know is darkness. Having their understanding darkness. This darkness is a consequence of sin. The message of the cross brings light. Does it not? Because it is God. Because when God does it His way, or when we, we walk in God's way, it always brings light. My word is a lamp to your feet and a light unto your path. Having the understanding darkened. Like I said a little bit earlier, why? This answers the question. This is, is what we're dealing with. If you want to, as we've been dealing with uh, going through the book of Romans and taking what we find there to the world around us to witness, to, to call unbelievers to come to the Lord and understanding where they're coming from, understanding their mindset. This is their mindset. Their understanding has been darkened. That means there's no light there. Sin brings darkness. Sin brings death. Go back to Genesis. The darkness was a result of sin. That sin of, of Lucifer, whenever he rebelled against God, it brought darkness upon this earth. Where when God originally created it, he created it in light because he can't do anything less. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated. Listen to this. They are alienated. What is an alien? Somebody who doesn't know, somebody who is on the outside. Somebody who hasn't been there. Their understanding is darkened. Being alienated from what? The life of God. They don't know His life. Through, by means of the ignorance. Ooh! I don't care how educated you are. I don't care how many PhDs you've got. If you have turned your back on God and His salvation plan, brother, you are ignorant. It says it right there. There is an ignorance in this world that says it's okay to kill a baby in the womb. Yes. There is an ignorance in this world that says, oh, we can drink and do all this in moderation. There's an ignorance in the church. You hear me? There's an ignorance in this world that says you can smoke the dope and you'll be okay. It's ignorance. We see it evident more and more as the days go by. They are alienated from the life of God. What does it mean to be alienated from His life? That means death. There's no life because God is life. Then in Him is no darkness. Scripture says that, not just me. That's Scripture. They're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. And this is a willful ignorance because the Word of God is available to them as it is to us. And there's enough in man that he can look in this Word. I don't know the testimonies I've heard where they said I picked up the Bible and I gave my life to Jesus because of whatever it was. It doesn't matter where they read in this Word. God can, by His Holy Spirit can speak to them and can draw them to Himself. Amen. But unfortunately for the majority... They might hear this word preached. They might run across this on YouTube at some time. But they'll say, I choose not to believe. They push it away. And that's the ignorance and the blindness. I think there's another way. I think Confucius or Mohammed or whoever. Mooney whatever. Oh, there's got to be more than just one way. It can't just be Jesus. Yeah, it can. 
Because God don't need plan B. Plan A is perfect. Amen? Plan J, Jesus, perfect. However you want to call it. Having the understanding darkened. Being alienated. That's the state and their condition. Present tense alienated from the life of God through the ignorance by means of, because of, however you want to call it, the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. This is what we're seeing. This is what we deal with as we try to preach the gospel, as we try to take this word to our families that don't know Him. This is where they are. Understand that. They need to be taught. They need to be given that word. Because of the blindness of their heart. Do I have on blindness there? It'll come up. Oh, yes. You know, this blindness is not just a lack of being able to see. That's what the darkness brings. You know, when it's dark out, you can have vision. You understand what I'm saying? But when it's pitch black out, or you're in a place where it's pitch black, an attic down in a basement or whatever, I can't see my hand in front of my face. If there was just a little bit of light. Mm. Think about it. Just a little bit of light in a pitch dark place and you can see something. We need to be being that light. We need to be being that little bit of light in the hearts and the lives of those people around us so that they can see. Walk not as other Gentiles walk. We got too many in the church today that you can't tell the difference between them and the world. We can't tell the difference if they're saved or they're unsaved. They talk like the world. They look like the world. They walk like the world. Oh, I can have my drink. I can smoke my dog. Whatever it is. They look like the world. They're in darkness. They're no light. Be ye the light. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. When you're in a dark place, just a little bit of light, that place where you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, and just a little sliver of light comes through a crack, and it's like, oh, that's what this world's looking for. They're looking for that little, they're looking for you to be that sliver of light. But if you're being like them, and also that word blindness there, it means to harden or to petrify or to render insensitive, callous. Hmm. Through the callousness of their heart. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Because they don't know, because they refuse to know that willful ignorance. He says, who being past feeling, that past feeling there, the word there that's used for past feeling is the same word that we use for analgesic. What is an analgesic? It's something, a topical, whatever it might be. It's a, uh, what is it? Uh, 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 Anta, no, analgesic. Makes it where you can't feel nothing. I forgot the name. Anyway, you, you get a shot, you know, a topical. They, they, they give you it in your tooth if they go pull your tooth. If they're going to stitch you up, they give you a local anesthesia. That's the word I was looking for. But an analgesic and an anesthesia. It means you can't feel anything. That's how it is whenever we're, our hearts are hardened and callous. When you have a cow, boy, I got a story for that one. Working on a job yesterday up in an attic, crawling around on my knees. I hadn't done that in quite a while, so my knees got soft. And on both my knees, it rubbed blisters on my knees. And now I got blisters on about that big. Because the callus wasn't there. Lord, don't let me have a calloused heart. Oh, Lord, take this heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh, Lord, that you can mold and you can shape, Lord. Let my heart be soft to the things of the Lord. Let my knees be hard, but my heart be soft. Amen. Some of us need to be a little more like James. Camel's knees they said he had because he spent so much time praying. Oh Lord, give me calloused knees, but a soft heart. 
And that's what Paul is talking about here. The callousness of their heart. Too often times we got hard hearts and soft knees because we hadn't spent enough time with the Lord. The more time we spend with Him, the softer our hearts are going to be. Who being past feeling, they have no feeling any longer. They've been calloused. They've had an anesthesia. Oh my. What kind of anesthetics are we using today so we don't feel what's going on around us? Sometimes, hear me, sometimes God puts us in the fire. Sometimes He, he brings those trials. We used to always tell our kids, if you won't listen, you're going to have to feel. You see, sometimes we're that way with the Lord. We don't want to listen, so he says, all right, you're going to have to feel. But what do we do? What do we, oh my, what do we do in the lives of our kids, parents? God is trying to draw them. God is bringing them to a place where they got to hit rock bottom, where they got to throw up their hands and say, I can't do it any longer. I can't make it on my own. But what happens with mama and daddy? We go in sometimes and we thwart the work of the Holy Spirit in our children's lives by coming in and swooping in to the rescue because, oh, mama's going to take care of little baby. Sometimes we need to let the Lord do His work. Sometimes we hinder the work of the cross in the heart and life of not only our children but other believers around us. We can be praying for them. But sometimes we got to let those things... God is bringing them to that place. We become an, anest an anesthetic sometimes so they don't have to feel. Oh, Lord, help us to not be that way. Help us to be sensitive to the leading of Your Spirit that You can do the work in our hearts and in their hearts. God trying to work in us sometimes. And we run... We tell our woes to our brothers and sisters. It's all right talking to our brothers and sisters, but go to the Lord first. Amen. You know, don't be using them as your anesthetic, as your, oh, pray with me, and then you don't pray. You don't go to the Lord for yourself. I'm going to say something that might make some people mad. But don't be asking me to pray for you if you haven't gone to the Lord first. You hear me? You need to be having some time with Him. I will pray with you, but be praying, be seeking. You have that privilege. Amen. You have that privilege to come, just like I do, to come into His presence and to call out to Him. You have that privilege. Don't you be calling up brother or sister so-and-so and saying, oh, pray for me, and then you just go off and play or whatever. You be spending some time with the Lord first. That might be what he's trying to bring you to, the realization, the understanding that he's there for you. Amen. I know he's trying to bring us all to that. He is there. What's impossible with man is possible with God. He's trying to show us, I can when you can't. Amen. Mm. What says, I can? Pride. What did the devil say? I will ascend. And God said, ha, 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 I don't think so. Same way with you and I. We need Him more than ever. Who being past feeling have given themselves over. Hear what this is saying. Given themselves over. That means they have given, they have surrendered themselves to something. What have they surrendered? Oh my goodness. Hmm. Have given themselves over, surrendered themselves to lasciviousness. What is that lasciviousness? You know what that word means? Every kind of sexual immorality. Ooh. I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. I don't care what it is. Whatever kind of sexual sin it is, that is the greatest display of self and self-will and self-pleasure in the heart and life 
of anybody. I don't care if that sexual sin is homosexuality. I don't care if that sexual sin is deviancy in, in, in other areas. It don't matter if that sexual sin is between a young man and a young woman who are not married. Each one of them are performing that or engaged in that because it feels good to me. Because I get something from it. That young lady, she might be saying, Oh, I, I need his love. I want his... I, I, I. And that young man saying, I'm going to conquer. Young lady, you want to be conquered by some old hairy-legged punk? That's what his attitude is. He's wanting to conquer something. Self. Yes. It doesn't matter from homosexuality all the way down. It doesn't matter. Lasciviousness of se is sexual. Looking at pornography and all the other junk. They've given themselves. Willfully surrendered themselves to it. Whatever it is. Hmm. Because of the blindness, the callousness, the unfeeling in their lives. Because they have rejected. Walk not as other Gentiles walk. Don't live your life in this manner. This is not the abundant life that God has for you and me. John 10.10 10, The thief comes to kill to steal and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have life more abundant, Jesus said. That's not abundant life. Having been given over, basically they've sold themselves, they were already there, sold themselves as a slave to that kind of a life. And sin, as we've talked about in the past, it's been a while, but sin doesn't stop at a certain place. It goes on and on and spirals down, down, down and destroys. Sin will destroy your life. Sin will destroy your family and your children. I've used the picture of a, of a truck in a field. You scratch it. Brand new pretty looking truck. Scratch it down to the metal. The rust starts in. And the rust don't stop right there. But the rust, if it's not taken care of, will grow and grow and grow until finally it consumes all of the truck. You hear me today? That's sin in the life of the believer. It may start out as a little sin. The little foxes spoil the vine. It starts out small. But it grows. And it grows. And it grows like a cancer. If it's not cut out, it will grow and grow and eventually destroy the entirety. Don't think I can go so far in sin and oh, then I'll be okay. No. You don't have the strength to overcome it. Christian, walk not. That's what Paul, who's Paul's talking to here? Believers. If it were not possible for them to, he would not have to say don't. You hear me? Don't be giving yourself over to those things. Don't be saying, oh, I can take a little sip of the wine for dinner. I can smoke a little dope. I can look at a little bit of those pictures on the computer. I can cuss a little bit here and there because I'm man. No. It'll start eating like a canker. It'll destroy you. Yeah. Today it'll be one thing. One drink. One peak. One puff. Whatever. But tomorrow, oh, I can handle that. I can handle that. Before you know it, you're, you're bound. Chained down. Right. You see, God has set us free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. He's given us a new way to walk. He'll show it here. We don't have time this morning. But we have a new way to walk, a new way of thinking, a new way of living in Christ Jesus. I guess if I had to title this, I'd say it's a new way. We have a new way. That way is found in Christ. And you know what? Just as we know that everything God does is perfect, it's pure, it's holy, it's, it's right, God has the right way for you and I. He knows what's best. He made you. You believe that? He made you. He said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. 
Mm. Before your mama knew you, he knew you. He knew you inside and outside and up and down and in and out. He knows what's best for you. He knows what He has for you. He says, I have good things for you. I have what's good for you. You see, God's not going to take from you that which is good for you. And He's not going to give to you that which is bad for you. He's given us all things richly to enjoy in Christ Jesus. He knows what you need. Trust Him. We lie because we don't trust God. He's going to say down here, don't be lying to each other. We deceive because we don't trust God. Trust Him. In these times that we live in, He's calling us even more. You know, God's drawing a line in the sand. I, think, I, I really think that. And He's saying, those who are going to trust me, come on over here. He's telling that to the church. Those who are going to trust me, what he said, what did Jesus say, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. Don't hold back any longer. Whatever trial you're going through, whatever hardship you're experiencing, draw near to the Lord. Call out to Him. God is using that to say, I can take care of you. What's impossible with man, it ain't nothing for me to do it. Just come on. Let me take you. What did He tell us this morning? To, that, that He made the way across the Red Sea and He made it a dry way. Have you ever read that? you ever get that when you read it? He didn't just do it at the Red Sea. He did it at Jordan River when they crossed over there. When Joshua brought them, they didn't slop around in the mud. You see, God, when He makes a way, it's going to be a paved way. It's going to be the right way. You're not going to have to slop in the mud and get stuck in the muck. But God has made the way. And He's saying, come on over here and follow me and trust me and hold to my unchanging hand because I have the right way. When are we going to wake up? When are we going to trust Him? And call out to Him. Today is your day. Call out to Him today. Lord, I can't do it. But I'm trusting You. Lord, I can't make it on my own. But I know You can carry me through. I've said it before. I'm going to say it again in closing. The worst thing the world can do to you is to kill you. It tells us in the book of Revelation they're going to be beheaded for their witness for the Lord. That's their worst. <laughs> really? Absent from the body is present with the Lord. The worst the world can do is to chop your head off. But glory be to God, you go to be with Him in Amen. glory. Amen. What is precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Let's stand this morning. I want to encourage you. Trust in Him. Call out to Him. Let's sing that song that we played, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand, this morning. And let's just call out to Him and say, Lord, I'm going to hold on to You because You are my rock, You are my fortress. If you want to spend some time praying, come on down here and pray. If you want to just call out to Him, call out to Him this morning. Amen? But let's give Him praise today. And let's acknowledge that He is our strength. Amen?